Welcome to our first week using R. Um, anecdotally, I understand that many students um, find the R part of this course to be the most difficult. Anecdotally, I have heard that former students looking back are really grateful that they were able to learn R, or get an introduction to R, I should say, uh, in this class. One nice thing about R that you should keep in mind is there's lots of information online um, that will help you um, with your problems. So uh, this lecture uh, has uh, considerable content from uh, our own Dr. Hobbs's, uh, Tom Hobbs's uh, R primer. And uh, for some um, information comparing Excel and R, uh, Thomas Hopper's Excel Users Introduction to R. But what is R? Uh, it's a statistical programming language. It's a, a free open source package based on the S language developed by uh, Bell Labs back in, oh gosh, it must have been late 80s, early 90s. Um, both R and R Studio, which is the program we use for editing and running the R language, are free. It's very powerful for writing programs and especially uh, it has a, a special forte for statistics and creating graphs. Many statistical functions are already built into R itself. And then there is a wealth of contributed packages that um, expand the functionality to uh, cutting edge research. So pretty much uh, you can do whatever statistics you need to do, whether you're um, a student or a researcher um, using what's existing in R. So it's a programming language. So um, you need to write code to complete tasks. So you can either do that interactively, typing and getting responses from the, the computer, or you can write scripts, and scripts are pre, um, scripts are uh, collections of commands that are in a text file that the computer runs. And what we'll see is one of the big advantages to R is that it allows you to work up an analysis um, and save the script that does the analysis and then come back to it later. Whereas with a, a GUI, that is a graphical user interface, it's not always as easy to figure out what you did. Um, you know, one of the advantages, especially for someone like myself who has a relatively poor memory, um, having a text file full of commands that you use to do the work of processing a data set um, allows you to go back and quickly get refreshed on what you did. So, um, point and click software is great, um, but as I was just saying, a programming language is, is not only more powerful and flexible, but it does give you this advantage of a permanent record of what you've done. A programming language lets you write your own code. Again, it's adaptable, it's flexible, uh, particularly if there are lots of steps. Um, I know in my own work that sometimes I pick up a data file and it takes me a while to figure out, or a data analysis it takes me a while to figure out what I did. That's not as much of a problem with R. Um, computer programming is one of the most important skills in quantitative ecosystem science or ecology. 
and really these days, one of the most important skills you can have, period. So it's applicable to many areas of study. Why R and not something else? It's free, open source, it's portable. Um, you know, you can install it on your computer. You can use it on the PC labs. You can buy a new computer, set up R and be ready to go with uh, some existing scripts you've developed. It's at this point the premier language for statistical computing. I, I think that's fair to say can produce publication quality graphics. That is, uh, you don't have to sort of make a graph and then fool around with it in, you know, a paint program in order to get something that you could submit to a journal or put on the web. There's lots of free code. It's constantly getting better. <clears throat> it's easy to share since it's so widely used. There's lots of reference material, again, videos, um, uh, uh, cheat sheets, which are just like lists of common commands. Um, uh, there's a, a real abundance of user materials. Again, lots of online help and tutorials. And you don't need to be a computer scientist to use it really. Um, it's you can come at it just writing simple statements to do analyses like the ANOVAs or t-tests or regressions we've been talking about all the way up to um, writing programs that you know do, that uh, implement graphical user interfaces to your data um these are old graphs these are from like 2015 but um what i'm showing you there on the left is that uh, that's the number of r packages available so that was growing exponentially r packages are just um new software that implements new statistical analyses or plotting routines and on the right, I've got a graph of the, the someone I've went through and figured out how many papers referenced different software packages. Um, so academic papers that referenced a statistical package within them. And we've got a couple of old things, Stata, Statistica, and Minitab there on the right at the bottom. Um, and then SAS and SPSS. Now those have been the sort of premier commercial statistical packages and um, a lot of people still rely on those, uh, particularly in the commercial world. But you'll see R even in 2015 had, uh, 2015 had caught up with SAS. And I don't know what that, that graph looks like today, but um, R has become where where people are really putting their effort because uh, it is it's free it's open source you can it's it's highly modifiable and so um i've seen over my career that that r is really the the place to be um statistically Other advantages of R, uh, R is a very good help system built in. On the right there, what I'm showing you is um, a, a section of the R Studio interface. We'll be going into that in more detail. But um, if you're at the, the um, R prompt and you, um, so that's where you type commands into R. If you type question mark, okay, uh, and a command, then uh, it will give you information on that command as shown at right. Um, if, um, uh, you can also use that help command, help, parentheses, um, 
quote, hist for histogram, unquote, uh, uh, end parentheses. That'll give you the help on the histogram, histogram command. If you don't know what function you want to use, maybe you just know that you want to do a histogram, then you can do help.search histogram in quotes as shown there. So this is our GUI. Um, this is another way people um, use R. Um, and this is the console. So this is the same in R Studio. R Studio just has other panels that you can use. There's an editing panel for editing your scripts. There's a, a variable panel that shows you what variables you've defined. And this is what I mean when I say the R prompt. It's, uh, you know, when you start R, the program itself, um, you know, it spits out information about its version um, and gives you some information about the R project and some commands you can run. And that gives you that little uh, greater than sign. And that's your, your place to move your cursor over, click and start typing commands. So that's the, the console. Our studio is the more useful interface that we're going to use. And you can see that, you know, at the bottom left, that's where your console is. At the, the upper above that is where you can type in scripts as so a text editor like Word. Um, on the right, that's what we call uh, uh, generally two tabs are there workspace, which shows you uh, when you define variables. Uh, what those variables are and they also has a, a history tab there if you click on that it'll show you your prior commands and on the bottom right uh, a number of other pieces of data are shown and in this case it's showing you a plot so in the console we've defined some variables we've defined a variable d um, and we've defined a variable E. Each consists of a, 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 a list of numbers, okay? And we've then done a plot below that. Uh, and we're gonna get into that obviously in much more detail, but when we run the plot, the plot shows up in that lower right-hand window. So editor, console, workspace, and then on the bottom, you know, generally there's, uh, it'll show you files that you might have open, packages that you might have installed, uh, the help window, but then uh, most often you have your, your plotting output there. Uh, when you interact with R, you can use the up and the down arrow keys to go through your command in uh, history. Um, Within a command, you can use you use the left and right arrow keys to edit. And then uh, history, you can save over sessions so that, again, you have a way to remember what you've done. Multiple commands can be done on one line. Um, if you put in a semicolon as a separator between commands, then it will define, it will, it will run multiple commands on a single line. Here's a, an idea of what a, a first session might look like. So uh, we've got that, uh, that greater than sign. That is not something you're typing. That is something that um, is, is the prompt and is prompting you to type things in. So let's type x equals r norm 50. Uh, comma mean equals four um, and then close parentheses. So that generates a, a random variable that has a mean of four and a standard deviation of one. And it's a, a normal random variable. Okay? You, you type return, nothing's gonna happen. That variable will then have been defined. If you were working in our studio, you could look in the variable window and that X would show up. Before I continue, I'll just say, couldn't hurt for you to actually be doing this. It's not much typing. 
And if you're not familiar with this way of interacting with a computer, if you're not familiar with programming, then um, this is really going to help you prior to your first R lab. So we've defined X in that first uh, section. If we, we just type X and hit return, that's the same as saying, um, um, you know, give me the information or show me what X is. And so X is going to show you uh, in the, the each line starts with a number in brackets that shows you that what you've got here is a, a, a variable that's containing multiple numbers. And that number in brackets shows you the first index into that variable. So this X is a a variable that consists of 50 numbers, okay? Um, and if we did um, X um, bracket one, close bracket, that would be equal to 4.77, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the first element of it is 4.77, the 11th element below that is 5.49, et cetera. We can then run a function and anything in R that has parentheses um, after it, like in the example mean x, um, that's a function. And most things in R are functions. So that means we're, you know, just, a, just as in algebra f of x, that's a function. In R, we define functions that work on um, variables. So in this case, we have a function mean. So the mean of X is 3.88. Um, we now have a, another function that we can enter, range of X. That shows you the minimum and the maximum value. Histogram of X, okay, is a function but it creates a plotting object. So hist of x um, will give you that plot there at the right, although um, um, at the, the my first plot there at top, the title of, of the uh, um, histogram won't be there when you first run it. Um, so, what if we wanted to add that title? Well, we can use help to figure out how to change the title. And so question mark hist. And then if you looked at that information, you'd find out that you can do hist x comma. And now this is a keyword that we're gonna pass to the program histogram or hist. And we're gonna say, we're gonna, we're gonna tell it that the main title is equal to my first plot. And then if we run that whole command, it's going to give us a histogram plot with my first plot as the title. So, R supports math just like a calculator. Um, and the math and the, is not much different from Excel. Just type in the math that you want to perform. You don't have to proceed it with an equal sign uh, would be the difference. Um, so in the R console window, you know, you type one plus one, you get two. Um, five times 20, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. It's, it's exactly the same structure as you would have um, in Excel. And then R also has functions, uh, just as Excel does. For instance, you can generate random numbers across a wide variety of, of uh, distributions. So, um, you know, we did a random normal variable uh, function. Now we're doing an R, uh, a random binomial uh, function. So five numbers from a bimodial distribution. So R binom parentheses five, the number of numbers, the size, 
Um, so that's the size of the draw and the probability of a, uh, a true value will be 0 0.2. So we return and we then get a series of results. Um, we can then get five numbers from a Poisson distribution or a uniform distribution. So a uniform distribution just means that it's uniformly distributed between zero and one. And then again, five numbers from a, a Gaussian distribution. There, we're not specifying a mean and a standard deviation. So it's assuming that the um, mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So in Excel on the right, to do the same thing, you would have to type in your, um, your functions in individual cells because each individual cell conventionally in Excel only um, contains one number. So R allows you to create data structures that contain multiple values. And this will be useful because it'll allow us to represent, say, whole data sets with a single, um, a single variable. Uh, some functions may be familiar from Excel. The names are slightly different. So if, if X is 23.2456, we can find the next largest whole number, the ceiling, or the, um, the preceding whole number, the floor. We can round. Um, we can find uh, the significant dip, uh, um, significant um, um, values within X, or um, we can say what is the the first significant value. Um, so if, if there's only one significant value there, then the value of that would be 20. If we say there are two significant values, it would be 23. Uh, and again, these numbers show up in your um, your workspace, and um, you can see the equivalencies here between what you would see in a workspace versus what you would see in Excel. Now, in this case, our values um, are just labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, but you know, I should point out that you could have much more meaningful values uh, or um, I'm sorry, you might have much more meaningful names for your variables. So, you know, you could call it fish length. And that's a lot easier to remember that, oh, D is equal to fish length or whatever is equal to fish length. So we're going to assign values to variables instead of using rows and columns. Um, in R, um, the values and locations of your, your data are hidden, although you can see them in the workspace pane. Um, and it means that you don't have to worry about like inserting columns and deleting columns and, and maybe inserting rows, but you know, classic problem, you know, you you insert um, a series of cells into a table and you've forgotten to insert the cells all the way across the table. So, you know, if you have your um, variables in columns and your observations in rows, um, it's very easy in Excel to screw up, honestly, and, and, and insert or move some values and not move all of the rows um, or all the columns for a given row. And then your data becomes um, um, trying to think of a nice word. Your, your data becomes, um, um, you know, you've moved values from one observation to another and that's never good. Uh, one variable can store many pieces of information, and as we'll see, even a, a whole data set 
can just be referred to as one variable. So in um, Excel, you might, um, you might define two variables, x1 and x2, each of which has five observations, and then subtract them. Uh, in R, we would define the two variables, x1 and x2, and then define a third variable, x dot result. Now, as equal to x2 minus x1. Two things are important here. First of all, old R, and you will see this sometimes, that, that command is an assignment command, as are many commands in R. That is, we have taken what's on the right, x2 minus x1, and assigned it to x result, a variable. Okay, old R and S before it used that combination that you see there, the left bracket, I'm sorry, the left, uh, let it less than sign and a dash to mean a sign. So the idea was it was like, you're taking what's on the right and putting it into what's on the left. We now more generally just use the equal sign. Um, the reason is that in programming, and this is a general problem in programming, the equal sign sort of implies two things. The first thing it implies is, as it, as it would be used in, in this sort of case, assignment. That is, calculate some value on the right and assign it to the thing on the left. And the other thing it can be used for is to, um, Sort of ask the question, are two things equal? Okay, and every programming language has to have a way to um, to denote both of those things, right? One of which is assignment, the other one which is a logical question or a log uh, which we call a, a logical operator. And um, there have been various solutions. This is why they avoided equal in the beginning, but again, now we generally use the equal sign and use another symbol for asking the question, are these two things equal, okay? So one of the nice things about this, Excel versus R, is in Excel, you know, we, we know that well, we've typed in X1, X2, and X result, those are uh, are, you know, um, literals, things we've typed in. And then every other number is a calculation. So, um, you know, A2, cell A2 is equal to, say, RAND. Um, so if you double clicked on it, you would see equals RAND parentheses and parentheses. Okay. Um, and so on for all the values of x1 and the values of x2 and also in x result so uh in x result if you double clicked on that presumably that would be you would see equal sign a2 minus b2 okay fair enough so those um those the, the, the method that was used to get each cell is observable, right? You can just click on the cell, but um, in R, the way we do that is by presumably storing the commands we use to create X1, X2, and X result um, in a script or in a text file. And that allows us to go back uh, and know how each thing was defined and know that it was the same for all of the values of x1, x2, and x result. When a variable has multiple values associated with it, as it does here, we refer to it as a vector. So what we've done here is assign five random 
um, randomly picked normally distributed values to x1, 5 to x2, and when we subtract one from the other, each value is subtracted from the, um, the associated value. So the first um, number in x1 is subtracted from uh, x2 and stored in the first result or the first element uh, of x uh, result and so on and so forth. Again, type the name of the variable, it'll display its contents. Of course, you would also find that in the variable window within RStudio. So, um, when you supply a vector to an operator or a function, functions we've talked about, that's what um, you know, the text before the um, parentheses, that's the function. And then you have some information in parentheses that is passed to the function. Um, ours all automatically going to permit do math on the elements of the vector. And either a vector or a single value might be returned. So here we have on the left, we assign the number two to the variable x3. Um, then we might type in, again, this is all the, the R prompt, x3 times x3 to get the value four. Um, what if we take x1, the random number we defined in the last slide, and add x3 to it? Well, um, it's going to go through and it's going to say, I have a vector and I have a single value. In that case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add that single value to each of the elements of the vector. And so um, uh, it's going to give you uh, a new variable. Actually, this variable is never stored. It creates, creates the variable and then it gets rid of it because we have not done an assignment. Um, where the values are 2 plus the original values of x1. Now, if we add two vectors together, okay, then what R will do is it will go element by element to form another vector of the same length, similar to adding in the columns as we saw before. We can then multiply two vectors together element by element. So this is x1 times x3. So in that case, okay, the single value of x3 will be used to multiply each of the variables, um, each of the elements, I'm sorry, of the x1 vector. And we can also calculate the square of each element in x1. So x1 caret or to the power of x3. That caret is what's used for exponentiation in uh, a, a great number of computer languages. Here on the right, I've done a little shorthand for you. Um, that first line, um, d is equal to 1 colon 10, that sets d to the values 1 through 10. Okay? So it's going to be a vector of length 10 with the values 1 through 10. We're going to set a new, an, another variable right there, f. And we'll say f is equals to d to the power of 2. Now I type f. And you can see that those are the values of 1 to 10 squared. Now I'll have a, another function there, sum. And that's going to add up all the values in that vector. And that happens to be equal to 385. Um, mean or standard deviation, STDV, um, works the same way. It takes a vector and gives you a single value. Now, we can also work on the individual elements of a vector. So 
we're going to do something similar to that uh, x equals 1 colon 10 uh, with a command called seek, S-E-Q for sequential. And that's just a little more flexible. So sequential allows us to say, give us a series of numbers from starting from 100, adding one each time uh, to each subsequent element 20 times. So that's going to give us the value 100 to 119. We can then index or access uh, the third element of x. So x uh, brackets 3 close brackets. The third element is 102. Maybe we want to get two elements. So what we're going to do is x bracket c is a command you see very often. And it, it, it makes a vector out of um, individual numbers. So, uh, or I'm sorry, it can also make a vector of strings or, or basically anything else. Um, so c uh, parentheses 12 comma 14 close parentheses. So C, 12 comma 14, that evaluates to the numbers, to a, um, a vector containing the values 12 and 14. And then we're gonna look up element 12 and 14 of X. When we do, those values are 111 and 113. Um, we can also look at a range of values in X. So remember before, the colon operator, that is a quick way of getting a sequence of values. So X bracket one through five, one through five, one colon five is gonna generate the numbers one through five. And then the X bracket part is going to give us the first through fifth um, elements of the variable, the vector variable X. Here's another way we can define X. Um, we can define um, X as equal to, here we're using the old assignment, C concatenation of four values, five, two, nine, four. Then we're gonna define uh, V as equal to um, a concatenation of four truth values, true and false, okay? And then we're gonna look up within X, and this is a little, little tricky, that truth value. And what R will do in this case is it will return the values uh, where it's, where V, the values in X where V is true. And you can see the, the two values associated with the true values in V in X is five and four. And so it's going to return five and four. Another way to create vectors, um, rep or replicate. So this is saying that, you know, assign to X 10 copies of the number zero, okay? So replicate zero 10 times in a vector, assign it to X. When we see X, that would just be 10 zeros. We can then assign to um, subsets of X various numbers. So from one to three, um, X from one to three, we're gonna assign it to value two. Um, so it's gonna put a two in each one of those places. And then from five to six, we're gonna put in um, a vector created using the C um, uh, of negative five and five. And so now if we look at X, what we see is the first three values are two and the fifth and sixth values respectively are negative five and five. So we've talked about Assignment statements, you can use that uh, less than dash combination, but most people use equals now. 
And a variable can be a number, it can be an integer, so a whole number or a, uh, a floating point number, real number, so with the fraction. Um, it can be a character or a series of characters. Um, it can be a vector, as we've seen. It can be a data frame, and we'll talk about that. Data frames are, you know, you know put simply, tables of values where each um, you have observations and then potentially multiple values or multiple variables associated with each observation. So some examples we should we should you know, those should be familiar with you, and then remember that order is important. So um, order is important in two ways. First of all, the order is important in terms of what um, uh, the order of of, of uh, evaluation on a single line, but then the order that you type them in. So um, you know if you define x. Um, and then add one to it, and then define y is equal to x minus two. That's going to be different than if you define x as ten, define y as x minus two, and then add one to x. Those are going to give you two different results. And if you don't understand that, you sh really should be at R, you know, in R Studio, and, and type those in and see what it tells you. I should take this opportunity to say that. In R, that um, pound sign is a comment sign. So in your scripts, you are you should put in comments. And on individual, you can either put the the pound sign. You put the pound sign anywhere, basically. You know, if you were writing a comment on a single line, you'd put the comment at the beginning of the line. But you can also put in a command and follow it by. The pound sign and then anything after the pound sign is a comment and is not evaluated and then at the bottom we have um, a function that create read table that creates a new variable fish data that consists of the um, data in a uh, a csv file a comma separated value file and so the the what we pass to read table is the name of the file in quotes. Um, we've told it that this file, um, well, because we've said read table, it's assuming it's a table. Sep is used to tell it what the separator is. So we put um, a comma in quotes. Okay. So we're saying the separator is a comma, and then the last bit there says there is a header. And so what it's going to do is it's going to read in the values of those headers or of the header about, you know, the headers, and it's going to sign um, the information in the table for each column is going to be accessible using that header name. Um, if your variable has a lot, uh, like it's a long vector, like in this case, x1 is assigned to the, you know, 500 random uh, variables. You can look at either the head or the tail of it, so the beginning or the end, um, so that you don't have, you know, long scrolling stuff going in your console. You can ask how many rows it has by using n row um, or length. And just an existing, you know, existing uh, or uh, an, uh, another possibility for using head, you can tell it how many values you want to see. RStudio also allows you to view data in spreadsheets like a table. So um, if you go into the workspace pane in the upper right, usually, you double click on a variable, it will show you a variable and it will give you at the top you know those those very those values those names that would have been in uh, the header of that csv value if file if that was the csv file um, excuse me file and 
you know, at the top there, it's going to give you the variable names and then the observations uh, like a spreadsheet. Um, and note, the columns don't have letters as they would in Excel. They're given names um, to identifying them. And this allows you to have a variable with a default um, uh, a name for each. So you can assign, I'm sorry, this figure shows default names but you can assign meaningful names or the names could be in the header of a file. And so that's more meaningful than saying, you know, A1 or, um, you know, B17 as you would in Excel. So our rep, you know what? Uh, before I start this slide, I'm gonna say this. You might wanna take a break, get a glass of water, Got a glass of coffee, uh, walk around, it's been uh, 45 minutes. So that would be like one normal uh, class lecture. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're taking it easy getting into R. So, um, you know, hit the pause button, take a break if you need it. Um, if not, we'll start again. So R recognizes at least 15 different types of data. Um, several of these are related to identifying functions and other kinds of objects. Most users don't, don't need to worry about them. The main types that you'll need are numeric, real numbers. So those are numbers with a, um, that, that can have a fractional part. Complex numbers, so imaginary real numbers, you know, a combination of, of uh, a real and an imaginary is complex. Um, integers, so these are numbers that do not have a decimal point. Uh, and um, so it would be for like count data or frequency data. Um, logical values, so that stores true or false. And character values that are text strings. Um, and then of course, combinations um, of those things. And I'm just giving you some examples there at the bottom, um, showing you, you can define um, a numeric vector. You can convert that into a string. Uh, um, you can look at, get information about it, sorry, with STR. And that shows you that it's a, a number, numeric values, and it's showing the first five values. Um, you can, um, Make a vector that includes both numeric information and a string, string denoted as being in quotes there. And if you do that, then your vector is going to be forced to be the a single kind of, of data, right? A single data type. And so in this case, since those numbers can be expressed as character strings, but name in quotes cannot, it, um, it, uh, it uh, makes them all uh, character values. And you can check that using that str command. So um, it says, oh, look, we've defined v2 there as a vector of characters, and this is what's in them. If you try to then take that V2 and multiply it by a numeric value, it will not allow you to because it's a character, okay? It's, it's stored it as string values and you can only do certain string things with strings. Now, if your string, your vector of strings just consists of a, um, of, um, properly formatted numbers, then you can convert those back into numeric values and then multiply by, by 10. A factor is a special kind of character vector, and we've talked about factors in ANOVA. Same idea. In this case, the text string signified the factors that you're gonna use in a statistical analysis. Now here, um, we're looking at the data set fish data, which we defined 
um, at least conceptually, with read.csv back two or three slides ago. Okay, so um, within fish data, there's a variable called time, and it's been defined as a factor. So when we ask what kind of class it is, it's it will tell us it's a factor. Um, if we ask what levels are associated with that fish data, it will tell us that there are two levels, post-fire and pre-fire. Data frames are the most widely useful type of variable because, you know, again, generally we're dealing with data that if it's complex enough to be used in R, then it's probably complex enough that it consists of multiple observations and multiple variables associated with those observations. So, um, um, uh, it has multiple columns. All the values in a column have to be of the same type. So numeric or um, string, a character that is. And all the columns must have the same number of rows. So the number of observations. If not named explicitly in some way, are names rows by their own number and columns according to the data assigned to the column. So um, again, if you had read in um, the fish data, the you told that there was a header, the names of each column are gonna be assigned the value of the header above each one of the columns. In this case, we're defining a data frame in um, uh, 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 on the command line. So data dot frame parentheses R norm five R norm five R norm five close parentheses. The, there are commas in there, but that pause is sort of meant to uh, represent the comma. Um, something people commonly do. If you did that uh, and hit return, what you'd find is you would get um, this table output and the ver the uh, the column names would have been assigned programmatically just the R norm dot five because you had five um, values that you associated with the R norm and then um, you would have R norm period five period period one R norm period five period period two etc for each subsequent column. So um, to import a data set into R as a data table, you need to format it to make it easier to work with. And so the things you should do are to replace any existing header with a, a simple name that describes the data in a single character string without spaces, right? So you don't want like multiple, multiple rows. You want a single row with each of the column names and you know people have different ways of, of of characterizing or replacing spaces you can i use underscores other people use periods other people don't put any character in there and just use a combination of upper and lowercase letters to um, describe each one of the variables um, and this allows you to, to access those variables by name later in your analysis um, if there are any missing values, replace them with the two letters NA, which is like uh, not applicable or not available. And R will ignore those values when they make when it makes calculations. Then save that file so it's in a CSV format. Um, as I started to talk about before, text-based data files that separate values with a delimiter comma separated or tab limited or that use a fixed width fixed width column layout um, are easiest to import into and export from R. So here we have an example fish data underscore for R equals to um, read dot table parentheses name of the file in quotes comma the name of the separator in quotes um, and then header equals true. And that's going to give you a new variable in your workspace. Um, and if we went to the workspace and double clicked on it, what we'd find is 
um, something, uh, you know, similar to an Excel spreadsheet, but um, rather than having letters describing each column, we have variable names. So time, capture ID, length in centimeters, and mass in grams. So each variable or column can be accessed by its name by appending a variable name to the to the frame's name. So in this case, the frame, the data frame's name is fish data underscore 4R. We then put in a dollar sign and the name of the variable or, or, um, or column within it. You can also use bracket notation, okay? So fish data underscore 4R dollar sign capture ID gives you all the capture ideas. You could just get the head of that. Um, you can also, if you wanted to, access the columns numerically. So fish data underscore 4R bracket comma three is going to give you the, um, we're just gonna show the beginning of it because we used head, the third column. Um, you can also use this double bracket notation to get the fourth column. And there we have an example of getting the third column but looking at the tail. Um, okay. Individual elements within the data frame can be accessed by appending the bracket notation to the variable name. So um, here we have again fish data underscore 4R dollar sign length in centimeters, like underscore CM. That gives us all of it. Um, we can just look up the sixth, the value for the sixth observation. Okay. We can also access it by saying, give me the third column, fourth observation, as in that next line. Um, we can ask it to just give us the third column. Okay. So that'd be length in, in centimeters. And we can ask it to just give us the second row there at the bottom. So here we've done fish data underscore four R bracket two comma close back bracket. And that's going to say what that's going to return to us is, you know, that two at the, the beginning is for the second observation. Then we're going to get the time, the capture ID, the length in centimeters and the mass in grams for that observation. Um, you can also use more complex notation with the bracket. So for instance, you can get a slice of the data frame. So just that part of the data frame based on some condition or conditions. So for instance, fish data underscore 4R bracket, fish data 4R dollar sign length CM. So that evaluates to the column of length CM. And then we have the less than sign. So less than 15. Well, if we just did fish data underscore 4R dollar sign length CM uh, less than 15, that's going to evaluate to um, a, a logical or Boolean variable of, of the indices where that's true, okay? Or I'm sorry, it, it will evaluate to true and false values. Okay, remember that when we index a variable using truth values, it only returns those values uh, of the variable being indexed that have the, are associated with the true. So in this option here at the top, what or in this case at the top, what we've done is say, Give me all the values of fish data underscore 4R where the length in centimeters is less than 15 and give me the third column. So in that case, it's giving you the length um, uh, underscore centimeter value. This allows you to just pick out those values less than 15. And we could have put in another column. We could have said comma four at the end and just gotten the masses of the fish 
where the length was less than 15 centimeters. And this just gives you some more similar examples. You can, you can look at them. Save data, uh, it's similar to the reading a table. We can do write table, our data frame, file name, of course. You would want a fully, um, uh, a fully referenced file name. That is, you would want to tell it where the directory is, as well as the name of the file. Tell it what separator to use, and say yes, there are column names um, um, associated with that variable, fish data underscore four r. Some basic graphics, okay? So hist is gonna give you a histogram. So if we have some um, variable, some data frame, my data, um, and one of the columns is weight gain, then that's, we pass that to hist. It's the language we use. We call the, value, the function hist with that data. Um, we get this histogram. We can add a title for histogram, as we saw before, the, the title is specified by this keyword, main equals quote, weight gain in this case, unquote. We can add access labels, okay? So the keywords for that would be xlab or xlab and ylab to label those two axes. Uh, you can change colors, uh, so using the color statement. Um, so um, again, here we've just added in the xlab and the ylab the, uh, keywords and the column keyword with blue, and we get a nice blue histogram. And they need not be just individual colors. You can also specify that you want um, uh, a, a range of colors associated with values. So in this case, if we said that COL equals heat, then it will label um, columns or, or, or uh, you know bars that uh, histogram bars that have larger values with um, hotter colors, and um, those that are shorter. Um, with cooler colors. Uh, we can do a box plot very simply uh, using the same data. Add some labels. And before I, I get to the groupings, I should say that, you know, again, you know, sort of cast your mind back with the, with Excel. If I went and made a histogram in Excel, well, I, you can't actually make a histogram. Well, I think you can, but uh, I've honestly, I've never figured it out. I just use another program. Um, you can, in, in, in Excel, if you were, if you made a, a plot and then you wanted to change something, you might have to delete the plot and reselect the columns, et cetera, et cetera. If you went through that same process with making the box plot and then adding the labels and titles, et cetera, um, what you could do is simply hit the up arrow key, right? So just do the simple box plot command, um, then use the up arrow key and then Use the left arrow key, hit a comma, add your new keywords, right? And just sequentially uh, define more and more complex um, box plot. Now let me continue with box plots and, and groupings. So what if we want several box plots side by side so that you can compare them? Well, there are a couple of ways you could do this. So you could um, subset your data into separate variables. Again, using this, this ability to um, use logical statements to subset 
variables. So if we had a variable called my data, we could define a new variable wg dot or period low as equal to my data brackets all the observations where my data um, dollar sign type that type column is equal to low comma and because we haven't put anything past the comma that defaults to everything so that's all the columns for the rows where my data type is equal to low and then another one that says another variable that is just where my data dollar sign type is equal to high and to create a box plot for the two subsets so here's a here's an example um you know where we've created um uh, from another variable uh, weight gain we've we've subsetted out uh we're assuming male and female so we have weight gain dot male weight gain dot female dollar sign wg that's the weight gain we've had some labels and uh we get two side by side box plots uh suitable for comparison there are other ways of doing that but that's just a simple way scatter plots so uh, suppose we have two variables and we want to see a relationship between them. They're continuous. So we use scatter plots. In R, the simple um, scatter plot would just be, um, you know, plot x comma y. I, again, I'm, I'm sort of using the more common way that we communicate when we, we talk about programming. So if I was talking to another programmer and I said, you know, plot X comma Y, and we were talking about R, they would know that it happens to go in parentheses, but um, more, um, you know, if you look at it in a more detailed way, you would say plot parentheses X comma Y in parentheses. And there's an example using, uh, you know, where the example uses a, a new data um, frame called D, and it has two variables in it, min min and, and wg. And here's a more um, complex plot using that same on the same idea, weight gain versus met minutes, and looking at um, uh, the relationship. Here we've uh, uh, told uh, the plot command to use the triangle as um, as the symbol for each point and we've done that by using this little thing here pch equals two and you can look up in plot the uh, the values that you can assign to pch and you can also look up what pch stands for point character something a point character maybe uh, i honestly don't remember oh look there are all the point characters and their values. So you could use any one of those. Um, line plots. So often we have data that comes through time and we'd want to use a line plot. So here's an example where we defined a variable or a data frame D2 from a file called del.csv. Here we've used read.csv instead of table. Read.csv essentially is just read.table but it um it assumes that you're using comma separated values um now we're gonna plot i'm sorry we're gonna we're gonna assign to a variable t1 or time one the values one through the number of rows in d2 and then plot that variable t1 versus that stock price as we found it in csv in that csv file and here we go a little more complex command there to get time versus price and give it a nice little titles and labels and then we can overlay uh, lay graphs so we can take that um, graph that we um, we made before um, I'm sorry with one difference 
So now instead of using the variable del from within DT, we're using intel and plotting that. And then um, we're using, we have another command here, lines um, t1 time one, you know, that time variable. And we're plotting d2 dollar sign del, so the del cost over time. And we're using that lty command to give it a line style of two, which is dashed. We can also panel graphics, so we can put more than one graphic on a panel, and we can use par to give us a framework in which we panel our plots. So if we run this function par, we can use the keyword MF row to assign it a vec and assign it a vector concatenating n row and n call number of rows and number of calls. So we're sending that vector to the keyword MF row, and that's going to give us, when we do that, it's going to set us up for having multiple graphics in the same plot window. So here we're saying, <coughs> it was a two by two panel window, the histogram in the first uh, panel, a box plot in the second, um, a scatter plot in the third, and a line plot in the fourth. And there we go. Suitable for publication. Now, there are much more um, detailed and advanced plotting commands and plotting systems within R, but this shows you what can be done just with the simplest commands. Should you need to undefine, okay, your variables, okay, um, you can use the function rm to remove the variables, and then the keyword list. So we're passing a list of variables to be deleted to the function rm. And then we're assigning the results of the command ls, parentheses, m parentheses, which gives us the use, which gives us the name of all the, um, the variables currently defined. So you can use that as the first line in a script. Um, and that's good because maybe you've written a script and you have failed to define your variables. Uh, maybe there's one variable that you forgot to define, but because it's available in the workspace, it's going to keep do it's it's going to use it. And this way you would using that command, you would find that problem. If you want to start a new analysis and you want to maybe reuse your variable names, you can use that. Closing our studio and reopening it does not always clear the memory. So you might um, have variables and their and their variable and their values retained. So it's just a precautionary um, technique. All our code um, software and packages can be found at the, the R project website, um, and, or you can Google them honestly. And Google, the company, uses R quite a bit. So they've made it quite easy to find R packages uh, online. Um, the lecture and examples and other resources for this lecture are going to be posted on Canvas in this week's folder.